Welcome to Ageless by Rescue. This podcast is devoted to exploring the science of rejuvenation, uncovering the most trusted experts, the must-have products, innovations, and technology in the field of vitality, aesthetics, new beauty, and cosmetic enhancement. Dr. Libby Weaver, it has been six years since I've had you anywhere near what I do. And I'm so thrilled to see you. You look gorgeous, glowing, glorious. You're very kind. Thank you. Right back at you. I can't believe it's been six years, though. That's ridiculous. I think you've written probably 20 books since we last (laughs) met. I have never known a more prolific health expert than you and so beloved, you know, um, I remember a couple of times we published articles by you. We've had you, uh, I've had you in the studio at my old office. Now I work from home like most people, but um, it was always like such a buzz about having Dr. Libby. And I remember when I wrote my book, which I think was about seven years ago, going into a bookstore and being so excited that I was near your book. I I can't remember which one it was at the time, but thinking I'd finally arrived. (laughs) Oh, you're so kind. But isn't it fun to write a book and then have it be born out into the world? It's a real thrill, isn't it? Yes. And I've just finished reading one of your masterpieces. I really love this one. It seemed to, you know how things, there's serendipity in life. So this one kind of landed in my life at the right time. And I've got it here. It's one of the many books I have of yours, but this one is really cute. It's called The Invisible Load. Uh, It's about stress and overwhelm. And I think we've all had a collective moment of that. And wasn't New Year's Eve 2022 an awesome moment to reset and recalibrate? Yeah, it certainly was. I think some people do it a little bit later in January. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's it's a, it's a great time of year to reflect on what we care about and what we value and be grateful for the things that we have and also set our sights on what we want to unfold. Dr. Libby, what I really wanted to share with our audience today is some of your insights and experience from a medical perspective on the things that we can do to take hold of the regenerative process in our life. And, um, you know, I've had lots of different experts come at things from different angles, but our first port of call for most people is their GP or a a doctor uh, of medicine. So I wanted to get your insight as to what's available and what are some sensible things that we can do that will really make a difference in our search for a better health span, an improved lifespan, and a, a more energized, revitalized, you know, self. Hmm. And one of the things that I know you're an expert on and you speak about so eloquently is thyroid health. That's so kind that you you say that. It's something I care about very much and it's certainly a huge concern for more and more people these days. And there are many reasons why for a lot of people their thyroid just isn't working as well as it once did. And I think it's important to just discern that right from the start. You can have a thyroid disease but you can also have a thyroid gland that's just not working as well as it once did. So if we dive into that, the the beginning of the thyroid cascade, if you like, it actually begins in the hypothalamus, which is a region in the brain. And the hypothalamus makes a hormone that calls out to the pituitary gland that's also in our brain. And the pituitary gland then makes a hormone that most of your listeners will be familiar with. It's called TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. And TSH is the one that then communicates to the thyroid gland, which sits in the nape of our neck. And the thyroid itself produces T4 and T3. And T4 is inactive thyroid hormone and T3 is your active metabolism driving, temperature regulating hormone that literally every cell in the body needs. I think a lot of people think about when they think of their thyroid, they just think about weight loss. But if you can imagine the cells that make up your physical structure, every single one of those needs thyroid hormones to work optimally. So there are nutrients that are needed for this thyroid cascade to work properly. And those nutrients 
are iodine, selenium, iron, and zinc. Now, iodine is a sea-based, ocean-based nutrient, and a lot of people don't get enough of it on a daily basis. We only need a small amount. An adult female needs 150 micrograms per day to prevent deficiency. And so that's micrograms, not milligrams, like most nutrients are milligrams. Uh, then selenium is not in our soil. And obviously if a nutrient isn't in the soil, it can't be in our food and our mate, our really own, our really our only food source of uh, selenium these days is Brazil nuts. And if we're not eating those on a regular basis, then we need to supplement. Iron is the most common nutritional defi deficiency amongst women of menstruation age. It does improve a little bit after menopause, but uh, between 20 and 30% of women uh, in Australia are iron deficient across those menstruation years. And that alone can have a dramatic impact on thyroid function. And then of course there's zinc. And our only real food sources of zinc these days, again, zinc used to be in the soil. So when we ate fruits and vegetables, we got some, whereas now we only really get zinc from oysters, red meat, and then there's a little bit in eggs and a small amount in sunflower seeds. So again, it's a very common nutritional deficiency. So you can hear in those four key nutrients that that can be one road that leads the thyroid to not work properly. The next thing is our sex hormones. The thyroid loves progesterone and it doesn't love an excessive amount of estrogen. So we make most of our progesterone after ovulation. So if someone has polycystic ovarian syndrome, once someone starts to go through perimenopause, ovulation becomes irregular until eventually it ceases. And then obviously postmenopausally, there is no more ovulation. We still make a very small amount of progesterone from our adrenal glands postmenopausally, but while, while someone is, is menstruating, you want to have as many ovulatory cycles as you possibly can because the thyroid itself loves progesterone. And if you have trouble with ovulation and you've got an excessive amount of estrogen and your thyroid's not working properly, quite often that's the thing that needs to be addressed. If you address the sex hormone imbalance, you'll get an improvement in thyroid function. And I then the have third thing never, ever, ever gone to a doctor of any sort, and I go to many doctors for many things, and had this level of education about something that is obviously so fundamental <laughs> to our well-being, to our physical, mental, uh, sexual um, being. Um, and I'm, I interrupted you, but I just had to say, I, I honestly have never heard it explained in such a thorough and profound way. Number three, I interrupted. <laughs> no, thank you. I hope it's, I share it because I hope it's useful. I, there's a phrase I use in my work, the road in is the road out. And what I mean by that is, let's say someone clearly has a problem with their thyroid and it might be caused by an iodine deficiency. So if I give that person some iodine, their thyroid will come right. But if their thyroid problem is caused by a lack of progesterone and too much estrogen, then no amount of iodine will fix that. Sorting out the sex hormone imbalance is the thing that will correct it. So that's what I mean when I say the road in is the road out. But the third big thing that will that can contribute uh, to the thyroid not working as well as it once did uh, is when someone's had an infection, usually it's some sort of viral infection because viruses can keep living in the body. So glandular fever is a common one. Right. So glandular, glandular fever is the Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, now, some people, when they get glandular fever, they don't even know they've had it. They just find they have a blood test, you know, 15 years later and find out they've got antibodies to it. So it doesn't affect everybody in a detrimental way. Whereas other people get glandular fever and they go to bed for three months and they'll say something to me like, I've never felt the same since I had glandular fever. So when they've got that experience with coupled with a thyroid that's not working properly, you want to approach it by addressing and supporting the immune system. But one can of the common COVID have sorry to interrupt you. Can long COVID mimic that glandular fever viral impact on the thyroid? I don't know, but I imagine so. It's a it's a typical pattern for viruses. Mm. Mm. So when 
so firstly, working out what is causing someone's thyroid to not work as well as it once did is uh, really important. But a very common scenario that I've seen in my working life, primarily in nutrition, is it's almost like a cumulative effect. So, so someone will be iron deficient across their menstruation years and it's never fully properly addressed. They're always either at the low end of the normal range or it's consistently low. Now, iron is needed not just for the oxygenation of all of our tissues and so therefore for energy. We need iron for phase one liver detoxification. We need iron for thyroid function. So when we, when we live for years or decades with a degree of iron deficiency, it has a lot of, it takes a lot of toll on our biochemistry. So there's firstly that I would say that you've sort of got that at the heart of a lot of women's health challenges. And then if we add to that, the constant and relentless production of stress hormones uh, and Obviously, from a cellular perspective, when we have increased levels of stress hormones, everything tries to turn over faster and there's a lot more oxidative damage. Our requirement for antioxidants is higher. When we have lived with excessive amounts of cortisol, one of our stress hormones, it can slowly and gradually disrupt our ability to regulate blood glucose. We can end up insulin resistant. And so by the time someone is sort of reaching that perimenopause time in their life where ovulation ceases to be regular, so we don't get that lovely big surge of progesterone every month, not only do you have sort of the consequences and the symptoms that can arise from that sex hormone imbalance, you also then can really start to feel what's been there all along, but progesterone has protected you from experiencing because once the progester because progesterone is such a powerful anti-anxiety agent, it's an antidepressant, it's a diuretic, so it allows you to get rid of excess fluid. Because progesterone has a lot of lovely biological effects when we make the right amount of it, when we lose that, we also then can start to our, our thyroid doesn't isn't getting what it has needed. And if your thyroid's been working perfectly and it's been beautifully supported for most of your life no problem. But if you've got the beginning of a problem with the thyroid, it will quite often get diagnosed around that perimenopause time because that loss of progesterone is almost like the straw that breaks the camel's back for thyroid function. And then the, the other thing that I would add to that, at, so as we go through that perimenopause men, transition to be postmenopausal, there is a natural androgen dominance that occurs at that time now the language I use here is really important so when I say androgen dominance what I that's not necessarily an excess that's just from a ratio perspective because obviously at menopause we've stopped ovulating so there's no progesterone we if we've still got our ovaries when we go through menopause you make about 10 percent of estrogen still postmenopausally from the ovaries uh, that 10% of what you were making prior to going through menopause. You'll also make a small amount of estrogen from a few other places in your body, including your body fat, but your ovaries will still give you a tiny little bit. However, and then obviously the body can convert androgens like testosterone into estrogen if it need, if it wants to top up those estrogen levels. So this is in the event that you're not taking any hormone replacement therapy, you're not taking DHEA, you're not doing anything, you're just living your life. Correct. In that perimenopause to postmenopause phase. Correct. Yeah, that's right. So for far too many adults now, we go into perimenopause insulin resistant. So what that means is, let's say, when we have a healthy insulin response, let's say we needed, we have a, a blood glucose level, a blood sugar level of five, and we need five units of insulin to deal with that. When we're insulin resistant, our blood glucose is at five, so that blood test will be normal, but we've, we need 10 units of insulin to deal with that now. That's insulin resistant. And the problem with that is when you have high circulating levels of insulin all the time, your body is getting the message to its storage, store everything, store fat, hold on to it. So you can be as, you know, 
it's why I've created some of my online courses because I wanted people to understand you, counting calories is never going to override the instruction of some of these hormones like insulin saying store everything. Yes. So then if we if we stay insulin resistant, some people then their biochemistry changes again and they become what's called leptin resistant. And obviously leptin is a hormone that helps to regulate uh, satiety. So when we're insulin resistant, what's supposed to happen is leptin is supposed to kick in and say, you've had enough to eat, stop eating, and then that will lower leptin and also lower insulin. But if someone is insulin resistant, the insulin doesn't decrease. And so you try to make more and more leptin to try to get your insulin to come down, but it, it's not coming down because you're resistant to it lowering. So, so now this is one of the reasons that, you know, you do have that postmenopausal weight gain that you just, you think, well, I'm doing everything that I've always done. I'm exercising, I'm eating well, but what's going on here? That's the storage of the fat. That's that pause that the body wants. This is one of the mechanisms. There's a few across that menopausal transition. There's a few shifts in biochemistry, which can be addressed, but we need to know about them so that we can address them appropriately. So, but this is one of them, yes. And so if we're then leptin resistant, we have excessive amounts of leptin and that then disrupts thyroid function. So remember when I talked about the cascade, hypothalamus to the pituitary, to the thyroid itself, when the thyroid makes T4, it will convert most of that T4 into T3 when it needs to. However, when we're leptin resistant, instead of the T4 being converted into T3, the body will convert T4 into a different form of T3 called reverse T3. And reverse T3 doesn't have the same metabolism driving, temperature regulating effects that T3 does. And the other problem with reverse T3 is that it will bind to the receptors where proper T3 is supposed to go. So that leaves no space for T3 to actually bind. So when someone has this going on, a blood test will show up usually as fairly normal. It, things might be skewed in one direction, but things will be in the normal range. And you don't know that you've got this going on until you do further testing and test things like reverse T3, test insulin, for example. So that's one of the that's a very common mechanism that's happening for a lot of women now around the middle of their life. Uh, and then another one that another big shift that can come across that menopausal transition is when we're insulin resistant, when we when we stop making progesterone because we've stopped ovulating, and then we're just making a small amount of in, uh, estrogen uh, once we're postmenopausal, testosterone doesn't really shift that much. And that's what I mean, that there's a natural androgen, male sex hormones, natural androgen dominance, whereas before we had more of the other hormones. The trouble if we go through menopause when we're insulin resistant, it makes that androgen scenario, it puts it into excess. And so we insulin will lead to a bigger production of those androgens, of those male sex hormones. Which does what? It will lead to hair on our face. It will lead to our hair on our head thinning. It leads to belly fat that won't shift. And then further to that, a lot of cells in our body make an enzyme called aromatase, but belly fat cells are particularly good at making this enzyme called aromatase. And aromatase converts androgens like testosterone into estrogens, but it converts estrogen quite often into a concerning form of estrogen. So when we have that belly fat, it leads us to make more of this enzyme, which can lead to us, even postmenopausally, making a type of estrogen that is not good for us. And our liver, sorry, this is a lot of chemistry, our liver has That's to fantastic. then... It's really one of the most detailed explanations of this process. It's wonderful <laughs> to hear it. I, I'm enjoying it. I hope you are too. <laughs> okay, good. Um, I hope it's not too much. <laughs> this is how my brain operates, though. I just see it go from one thing to another to another. Um, so when we've got, when we're no matter where the estrogen comes from, whether estrogen is made inside of us by our ovaries, if it's if the estrogen is made by aromatase converting testosterone into a form of estrogen, 
uh, if it's coming from a synthetic form like HRT, if it's coming from a body identical form, wherever the estrogen comes from, the liver has to change the structure of estrogen before we can get rid of it. Estrogen has to be detoxified before we can get rid of it. And so I think what for a lot of people, they don't realize that they've still got to look after their estrogen metabolism postmenopausally because your ovaries will still make a small amount, your body fat will still make some, and your body will be converting some of the testosterone into estrogen. So you've got to be able to detoxify it for your and get rid of it efficiently from your body for your whole life because you don't want those problematic forms of e estrogen circulating. And that, but, that detoxification happens in your liver. So separate to identifying your thyroid function, separate to understanding what your sex hormones are doing, your production of estrogen levels, you also need for the rest of your life to be sure that you're correctly metabolizing and detoxifying the estrogen that is floating around your body. Beautifully said, yes. And so you can see, though, that when we talk about the thyroid, there are numerous roads that can lead it to not work optimally. And I always do. I always try to get to the heart of what it is for someone to correct that thing. And whether it's a nutrient deficiency, a problem with sex hormones, but insulin resistance is one of the biggest contributors to metabolic dysfunction in so many people today. And uh, so many things improve once we address insulin resistance, including thyroid function. I want to ask you um, about insulin resistance because there's an enormous amount of talk at the moment about diabetes medications being used as anti-aging, as weight loss. You know, we've, we've got the surge of interest in Ozempic, which is a diabetic medication. Metformin has been used for a number of years now um, outside of its, you know, protocols for diabetic management. Um, there's also a lot of talk about berberine, which is a natural supplement that can also mimic the same uh, results as metformin. If you're talking about this being a really key part of health, um, most doctors won't prescribe um, metformin or berberine or anything of the sort uh, as a preventative measure, they wait until you get diabetes before they give you um, supplements or medication for it. Are you saying that there are other natural things we can do in lieu of if we can't get hold of these uh, medications and supplements? So I always will look at food first. I'm a big fan of getting to the heart of something rather than just band-aiding it. So not very long ago, uh, we didn't eat very much sugar, for example, whereas now on average we're consuming between 37 and 45 kilograms of sugar per person per year in Australia and New Zealand. So that's a, it's a ridiculous amount. Now, the World Health Organization says that six teaspoons a day is okay, uh, but it's incredibly common for people when they're eating processed foods without them even realising to get up to, you know, 60 teaspoons a day can be just so easy when there's and processed foods. of course, with alcohol as well, yeah. like that's blind sugar, right? Yes, absolutely. So when, we, when we're consuming, you know, a food that is so disruptive to so much to, to do with our metabolic health, that's one of the biggest things I think we need to change, and but it's one of the things that people find the hardest to change. And so I'm a person who dives into that. So there's three pillars to my work, biochemistry, nutrition, and emotions. And so if I put my biochemistry hat on for a minute and look at what happens with sugar, it leads to, we get a dopamine hit from it in the same way people get a dopamine hit from other drugs which is why they're so addictive. Sugar is addictive through that same dopamine kind of mechanism. And a study was, I've seen this in clients over the years, uh, but a study was actually done with mice where they gave mice free access to a sucrose, a sugar rich uh, liquid water, and they could drink as much as they wanted for 12 hours. And then that liquid was removed and they were supposed to go to sleep. That sounds uh, like it, a margarita to me. Yeah. <laughs> so, and it was done for this whole experiment was done for three weeks. And at the start of the experiment, the mice would have on average 37 mils 
of this uh, sugar-rich liquid. But by the end of uh, the three-week experiment, they were having 120 mils. So what that shows is that, and they were looking at the dopamine response in their brain. So when in the beginning, when they had 37 mils, that led to a dopamine response, but it doesn't last. And what the mice were pursuing was more and more sugar to get that same dopamine hit. So when I'm so to, to help people, I look at okay. So you, if you make a change to your sugar consumption because you really want to address the insulin resistance, you're going to go through essentially a withdrawal, and the drive for you to go back and eat that will be very strong because you'll want the pleasure experience that the dopamine gives you. So we've got to look at other things that are pleasurable for you even more so across this time, so that you still you know feel good in yourself, or at least if you feel a bit lousy, you understand what's happening. But then I also, if I put my emotional hat on for a minute, I want to understand what leads someone to make food choices that they ultimately know in their heart is harming them. There's a question I ask in my work, why do we do what we do, even though we have the knowledge that we have? And it's why not a lack do of... Why we do the things that we do? Yeah. <laughs> Billion dollars. It's, it's not a lack of knowledge or education that leads someone to polish off a whole packet of biscuits after dinner. No one does that thinking they're going to feel terrific afterwards. They start eating, they feel like they can't stop it. And then after they've done it, they usually judge themselves very harshly. We think things like, I ate too many biscuits, therefore I'm hopeless, I'm pathetic, I have no willpower. And it's that judgment that we pass on ourselves that actually leads us to keep going with the lousy, hurtful food choices. So I'm always curious what, what yeah what leads someone to go there from an emotional perspective and the simplest way I can describe it uh, at this point in my work is we consciously or unconsciously perceive the disapproval of others and because when we perceive disapproval on on a very deep level we fear being ostracized and if if we were ostracized when we lived when we were tribal, it risked our life was at risk. When we're when we're born now as little human babies, we need adults in our life to provide us with food and clothing and shelter. We can't get those things for ourselves when we're little. And we it gets wired into our nervous system that the, the, the adults in our life, that their love or at least their approval or acceptance of us is crucial to our survival because if we fall out of favour with them, they might not give us food and clothing and shelter and then we literally won't survive. But we know as adults that a life with love and approval in it is it's very comfortable and it feels really lovely, but we could get by without it because we can get our own food and clothing and shelter. But a lot of us still live our lives as if that requirement for approval is crucial to our survival. And what we do all day is something will happen. So, you know, someone doesn't text us back or return a call or email us back or someone has a particular look on their face, someone says something or doesn't say something. And from all of those little tiny experiences, we create meanings about what they think of us. Yes. that they didn't fix back or what. And we stack those experiences across each day and for some, and, and usually create a meaning that uh, of disapproval in some form. And so then without knowing it, we either numb ourselves from being in touch with that or the fear of that or the sadness of that. We try to escape from the emotion that is sitting there just under the surface. And a lot of people use food to do that which doesn't work and it leads them usually then to it leads the men to be really you know sat, even sadder with themselves so that's why I love to get to the heart of what's really going on for someone so the actually, three pillars that you speak about so yeah. tying that back to what you were saying about managing insulin levels naturally you you say that one of the key things we can do is manage our sugar consumption. So if we're not taking metformin, if we're not taking uh, supplements, if we can just cut down on sugar, that that is the first and most powerful step we can take towards uh, insulin regulation. Sure what is. about going backwards to what you were saying about thyroids? Because you were talking about, you said something really interesting, which 
I guess, set off an alarm bell in me is that the test will come back normal, but we have to dig around. Now, one of the things that I hear most from my audience in DMs and emails is that they will go to a doctor and they will be kind of rushed through uh, a screening process, maybe if they're lucky, offered blood tests. Um, the, they'll come back to see their results. It's a perfunctory review of the blood tests. Very few of them can get access to, um, you know, uh, even HRT or DHEA. Most uh, One of the most common emails I get is, where can I find a doctor who will prescribe uh, HRT and DHEA? But you were saying with thyroid um, malfunction and even insulin resistance, sometimes the blood markers will come up okay, but the doctor has to dig further. What can we do to kind of improve our agency for our health? Are there things that we can ask for? Are there things that we should, uh, you know, other than reading and listening and um, uh, investigating, what can we ask for from our GP, who is possibly our first point of call or our naturopath? to kind of take the investigation further because it's really hard for most people to push back on a perfunctory review of their medical dashboard. Mm. It's a great question. And it's, it's, it's asking for continued help with real respect and consideration for the position the professional is in. So sometimes and I've had so many people over the years share exactly what you've just said. <laughs> Sometimes I think ego gets in the way, the health professional's ego. Sometimes they lack knowledge. They literally don't know where else to look, but they're not brave enough or um, they're not going to say that. I don't know. I'm, I'm, at a, I'm at my wit's end. I don't know where else to go for you. Um, so then if that's the case, we need to get another opinion. We need to find another person who has a deeper knowledge, a more expansive knowledge in the area, in this case, thyroid, for example, that we're wanting to look at. And But what if you don't know it's your thyroid? Um, and you, you know, should should we be going to our uh, medical practitioners and saying, please give me a comprehensive thyroid test. Please check me for insulin resistance. Please check my sex hormones. Is that, is that how we we could be and should be advocating for ourselves once we start reaching that perimenopause stage? If you do that, you'll have, so we, it helps if you offer to pay for those blood tests because GPs aren't allowed to do tests simply to investigate. They've got to have evidence for why they would do a particular blood test. So you'll, people are told no when they ask for a lot of blood tests because the GP will get into trouble. So it can help to say, I'm very, I don't feel like myself. There's something that's not right. I don't know if it's my thyroid, my adrenals, insulin. I don't know what it is, my, my sex hormones. So I would really love to do a big batch of blood tests and I'm prepared to pay for those. That can help. Uh, you can see a natural medicine practitioner. So a very experienced naturopath, but again, you'd have to pay for those blood tests. And then obviously you can try to find an integrative GP in your area. An integrative GP is usually very knowledgeable and very comfortable ordering a whole heap of blood tests and they will find ways to justify it or they're, but yeah, they'll find ways to justify it to, to get you um, those blood tests and get more insight, particularly into this more nutritional side of things. Dr. Libby, I had so many inquiries about just this matter alone that last year we launched a virtual clinic and I partnered with a pathology company where you can buy pathology requests and blood test requests right. because that was the number one thing I was getting from readers and followers who were saying, where, where do we ask for these tests? So I partnered with a pathology company where you can buy these blood tests and take it to your doctor or they have telehealth associated with the test that you purchase and then you can have a telehealth consultation because so many people weren't weren't able to get that level of service and of course you know during um the pandemic it was hard to see your doctor everyone the medical system was stretched beyond belief but uh, that, that's really good advice that you know we should just simply say I'm prepared to pay for it and I'd like to investigate these things going back to what you were saying about 
sugar. I was wondering if you could also talk about, um, you know, we talked about the emotional aspect of where that addiction comes from and stems from, and also the historical, you know, um, development of, of that need for the dopamine hit. But I'm interested also to hear about your views on sugar and inflammation and how this impacts uh, brain aging, skin aging, organ aging, because one of the things that we know, for example, from misuse of alcohol, um, a, a, heart, a diet that's very high in sugar is the uh, inflammation that it causes in the body. Mm. So <clears throat> when so there's two fuels for the human body, glucose and fat, and we're always using a combination of both. It's just what's the ratio. So is it 50-50 right now or 80-20 in one direction or the other? And so when our cells are primarily using glucose, they produce compounds. I'm so sorry to stop you again, but we've gone out of sync again. I don't know if it's the in, your internet is slow, but could you talk again and we'll just pick it up from there? I'm plugged in. I'm hardwired in with the internet. I don't trust Wi-Fi, so I've got the, the cord in my... Okay, we're good again. Go, sorry. <laughs> sorry. So talk about the fat and the glucose. Mm -hmm. So there are two fuels for the human body, glucose and fat. We're always using a combination of both. But right now, is it 50-50 or say 80-20 in one or either direction? So when our cells are primarily using glucose, they can end up producing all sorts of substances that can contribute to inflammation if that goes on for too long and in excess. So when, for example, when we are living on a diet that is particularly high in sugar, it actually changes our gut microbiome. And we lose a particular bacteria that makes a substance that has a big impact on the way we then metabolize fat. So ketogenic diets right now are very popular and some people feel like they help them and others feel like they just their clothes get tighter and tighter on them. They don't work for people. And I'm sure part of it is what's going on with these with our gut microbiome and the regulation of fat metabolism of what we can absorb and then utilize and what the changes in our gut microbiome lead us to not be able to do because we've been having too much sugar for too long. So that then transfers to our experience with cognition and with memory and rounds back links up to what we were talking about earlier with insulin resistance. So there's a school of thought that thinks that cognitive decline and potentially dementia is almost like a type of insulin resistance that's going on in the brain. It needs a lot more research, but there's some evidence to suggest that that's actually going on. So we know that long-term excessive sugar consumption uh, is not just creates inflammation, but it can also lead to this, what they think is insulin resistance going on in the brain. So it's not going to help um, with, with avoiding that cognitive decline that I think really can, is a big concern for so many people these days. Of course, then with skin, we know that an excessive sugar consumption leads to telomere shortening, uh, additional uh, oxidative stress, there's, there's sort of no benefit that comes from it when, when it comes to our cellular health and uh, wanting to, to age gracefully. I think it's so interesting that there are, you know, we're prepared to spend so much money on certain remedies or preventative measures like, you know, training, biohacking, supplements, um, all sorts of, you know, retreats, medicines, but when you break it down, and I've now spoken to maybe 80 different experts on regenerative uh, medicine, health span, lifespan, nearly every single one comes back to three things, and that is sleep, uh, hormonal health, and uh, nutrition. And those three things are in our own hands, um, you know, how we take care of our children if we're parents, you know, where we can give our children a head start in longevity and health span. It, you don't need to have any particular, um, you know, doctor or um, subscription to anything. And yet all with all of this information available, we still do it and then want to reverse it where, you know, is it easier to put down the gummy bear or is it easier to go and have, you know, seven vials of blood taken and go on a, 
uh, you know, sugar uh, withdrawal. I don't know. I, it, it's funny. It's a funny thing that humans do, right? Mm. And it's it's why I developed the emotional pillar in my work, to be honest, because it fascinates me. Mm. Um, going to um, talking about tests and, and, you know, you touched on how to get the tests. What are some of the tests that you would really recommend that we consider? Um, I would say, you know, maybe from our mid 30s, mid 40s, mid 50s. Are there some tests that you think are non-negotiables for your patients that are important to you mm. so without doubt across the menstruation years and the perimenopausal transition iron studies is incredibly important so iron studies is four blood tests one of them obviously is iron and that's a reflection of your dietary intake and then what another test within that iron studies group is ferritin which is your iron storage and the normal range in australian and new zealand pathology companies right now uh, is the normal range for ferritin is 20 to 220. So that's a really broad, broad, broad normal range. We need normal ranges because it would be chaos without them. But I like to work with what the patient, what the person's describing. So if they're fatigued, the first thing I'm going to think of is iron. So my experience is that if someone's ferritin is less than 50, they'll be fatigued because of that. So I'm not happy, for example, if someone has a ferritin of 22, that's inside the normal range, they'll be told it's normal, but they'll feel lousy, they'll be really tired. And if they can get their iron, their ferritin up to more like 50 or ideally 80, they're going to feel just so much better just with that alone. So iron study is very important. A full thyroid panel, so TSH, T4, T3. That's the first thing I'm going to do. Like I am signing up for that thyroid panel straight away because I I'm pretty sure I've never had that in all of the tests that I've done. So go ahead. <laughs> uh, it's also really useful to look at thyroid antibodies. So antithyroid peroxidase, uh, they, they all have big silly names that they're usually on a pathology form just as thyroid antibodies. Uh, because some people can have normal thyroid hormones but still have elevated antibodies. And if that's the case, there's an autoimmune process going on against the thyroid that needs to be addressed. If someone uh, has long-standing digestive system problems, I would nearly always do TTG, which stands for tissue transglutaminase. That's a test for celiac disease. Now people can have a problem digesting gluten and be negative to celiac disease. I think there are probably many, many mechanisms through which we can react in a lousy way to gluten and celiac disease is just one of the ones that we currently understand. So just because you're negative to celiac disease doesn't necessarily mean that gluten is your friend. Some people digest it without a problem, but a lot of people do struggle to digest it. But TTG is a really uh, helpful test. I will nearly always want to look at, at someone's morning cortisol. So cortisol actually is supposed to be nice and high in the morning and then decrease across the day. But if someone has HPA, dis, HPA axis dysfunction, so hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis dysfunction, which a lot of people refer to as adrenal fatigue, if people have that HPA axis dysfunction, their morning cortisol will be the low end of normal. So again, you'll be told it's normal, but you want to see if it's right at that low end of normal, addressing your morning cortisol will make a difference to your energy and your vitality. Now, I've never then, heard anyone say um, your cortisol to be uh, lovely and high. So that's interesting that you that we want to start off with that high cortisol in the morning. It's crucial to help us bound out of bed with energy and vitality. Uh, when cortisol is a problem is when it's high at other times of the day or in the in the evening when it's not supposed to be. Mm. That you can also you can get a saliva test to look at cortisol at four different points across the day and into the evening. Uh, but usually an integrative GP or a, an experienced naturopath would organize that for someone if they're suspicious that there's some sort of uh, adrenal uh, problem, adrenal challenge happening. But just that that ordinary cortisol blood test can be helpful to be the beginning step in investigating that. Uh, vitamin D, love to test that. Vitamin B12, also another really important one to test. Uh, our zinc, zinc and copper. So some people have... Uh, it can take a long time for zinc levels to come up if someone has really high copper. 
because they compete for absorption. So that's why it's good to know where you're at with both zinc and copper. Obviously, zinc is crucial for over, oh gosh, it, it's needed for you to produce over about 300 different enzymes in the body. We need it for the health of our skin, for our immune system, all sorts of different aspects of our digestion. Uh, it's, a, it's a super important uh, nutrient. So that's another good one to test. And then depending on what's happening for you hormonally, there are times when testing our sex hormones is incredibly beneficial and there are other times when it might not offer that much insight. But where I, if, for example, if I want to know if someone's ovulating, then I want to know the length of their menstrual cycle. So if it's a 28-day cycle, I would test progesterone on day 21. If they are in a regular 35-day cycle, I'll test progesterone on day 28. So you want to test progesterone about seven days before you would normally menstruate. So on, on let's say it's a 28-day cycle and we're testing on day 21, I would test progesterone, estradiol, FH, uh, FSH and LH. So FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, LH, luteinizing hormone. So you want to look at what all of that's doing around the time when progesterone is supposed to be at its peak. And that's so it's a interesting because that seems to be one of the tests you would do, like if you're trying to fall pregnant, but it doesn't seem to be something that anyone has ever spoken to you about outside of the range of wanting to fall pregnant. Mm. You want to know where you, so it's key in fertility, but because progesterone, it plays a crucial role in fertility, absolutely. But it has so many other biological effects as exactly. we talked about. Like as, as I've learned today. So it's, it's really interesting that something that, you know, we're often not offered unless we're in that stage of our lives where we're trying to get pregnant is actually a great health marker to understand about yourself in your dashboard. So it's fantastic. Yeah, it is. And it has a big impact on psychological health. I wish every one of every age <laughs> knew that progesterone is a very powerful anti-anxiety agent. When, you know, for example, it's common for women to they'll describe that they don't sleep properly in the lead up to their period or they notice their sleep becomes very challenging and not at all restorative across the perimenopause transition, you know straight away that that's a lack of progesterone because it's progesterone gets converted into allopregnanolone, which is very, it's very, very calming. And it has that lovely calming action on the nervous system that allows us not just to sleep really well, but it also changes the way I think we're able to respond to the challenges in our life. Because you know what it's like when you're already really worked up on the inside because of, you know, for 4,000 different reasons, there are times when you can come off that busyness or intensity of the day and just relax into the evening. And then there are other times when that feels impossible. And there's many reasons for that, but progesterone is one of them. And you mentioned B12, now that's, and vitamin D, and and those are supplement, both of those are injections that I've had. So for vitamin T, D, I've had uh, a supplement as an injection and B12, you know, in periods of high stress, I've, I've had a booster shot of B12. Um, and so you recommend that that's something that you're tested for rather than just having the supplementation already? Yeah, I'm, I love to know where someone's at um, so that you just address what has what's whatever is awry in them, whatever's not at optimal levels for them, you then treat that. Because sometimes you might, I've seen lots of people with really high B12, you don't want to give more B12 to that person. So testing to know where you're at and then dealing with any deficiencies uh, is, I think, the way to go. And what about bone density tests? At what age do you recommend that, you know, we we take the reins and and check in to see how our bone density is? Um, I worry that that's not always a helpful test for people because I see bone as living tissue and it's connected to so many aspects of our physiology, like even our nervous system. Like the, there's a bone hormone um osteocalcin it's called that actually helps to modulate the hpa axis that stress response system our bone health is also connected to our immune health so our bones when we do a bone density test i think a lot of people just instantly think of calcium and 
our bone health is calcium is very important for our bone health, but it's not just about calcium maintaining healthy bones. I look at it as about it's all the ways we can improve our overall health for the sake of our bones. So, for example, if someone has chronic inflammation or insulin resistance, then we need to address those for the sake of our bones because both those things can be a problem for our bones. If we drink excessive amounts of alcohol, we want to change that for the sake of our bones as well as a gazillion other reasons. But I think about bone health as a part of overall health. And so to we also need to understand, and this is something that a bone density scan can't measure, we also need to understand ten, the concept of tensile bone strength. And that's a measure of the force that's required to bend bone to the point that it snaps. So if you think of a green tree branch, it's got the flexibility, right? That's it. And osteoporosis is a condition of low tensile strength. And that brittle low, bones, yeah. Yeah, due to lower levels of collagen, and it can't be measured with a bone density scan. And I think that's probably why it's been shown, calcium supplementation hasn't been shown to improve, uh, proven to prevent osteoporotic fracture. And I think that that's probably why. So when I'm thinking about bone, you know, by all means do a bone density test if you want to, but I care more about that tensile strength. So you want, when, when we think about our bone health, I think I want to correct any general health issues like excessive alcohol consumption or smoking or digestive problems or nutrient deficiencies. I encourage people to build muscle for their bone health, address insulin resistance and chronic inflammation. You want to sleep well for your bone health. And obviously vitamin D is critical that we predominantly get from sunshine. Vitamin K2 is also very important, which we can get from fermented foods. Uh, and vitamin K2 is very important because it actually puts the calcium that we eat into our bones rather than allowing the calcium to accumulate in blood vessels, for example, which is where we don't want it to be. You mentioned collagen and, of course, you know, you would have to be living under a rock if you haven't been um, inundated with the idea that collagen supplementation can be fantastic for all manner of rejuvenation. Specifically, um, there's a lot of talk about the impact on skin regeneration. Um, do you, I, I know that you have a supplements brand and I have taken your greens and reds. So um, that's, it's super easy to add. And I, I think, and I give it to my daughter as well, because I, I just don't think that you ever get enough of those nutrients, but I take collagen supplements and in my own personal experience, a measure of the improvement in my health, skin and nails, I think there's been a significant improvement. Do you believe in collagen supplementation? I don't know if you need to believe in it. I think we just need to understand what it does and how it works. And it's a very important structure in our body. It's just had a lot of attention recently. And I'm all about if people notice an improvement for themselves and it's not hurting them, then that's a great thing. So <clears throat> collagen obviously is made out of amino acids and amino acids are the building block of uh, all of our protein foods. The trouble is when we eat protein foods, our digestive system breaks that protein down into those amino acids. And then the body takes the amino acids and uses them wherever it wants them to go. So it will rebuild collagen if it needs to rebuild collagen. So collagen is uh, present in muscle meat when we consume it. It's just that when someone takes a collagen supplement, you obviously are concentrating the offering to your body of the amino acids that are necessary to actually create collagen to rebuild that structure in your body. So it's needed. I think a lot of people probably use it uh, for skin health, but I think it's important to understand it's needed for our, our joints. As I just said, it's needed for our bones. It's an incredibly important structural protein uh, in our body. Our protein digestion also will play a role in our body's ability to take the amino acids that we get from our food and actually construct collagen. And I also like to look at it from the other perspective of let's try and prevent its breakdown. So obviously sugar is a big destruct, a, a destructive mechanism when it comes to collagen and elastin, those um, st structural proteins in our body. Uh, vitamin C, 
is incredibly important for preventing damage to collagen and elastin that's already there and in place in the first it's place. It's a perfect antioxidant. It's really easy to get. It's inexpensive. Grape seed extract is another real superstar when it comes to its antioxidant action and its prevent and its um its care for the collagen we already have. So, uh, but yeah, I, I like to look at it from all of those different angles. Okay, to wrap it up, I am dying to know what supplements do you take and what are some wellness non-negotiables for you <laughs> so that's a lovely question uh i firstly i eat in a really nourishing way and that's not because i have rigid rules or it's just how i like to live um so i i eat in a really nourishing way uh supplements i i flip and choose whatever i want to do in a day so it's different every day so BioBlend's Liver Love is something that I take pretty much every day. Uh, I do take a combination, uh, a skin nutrition, it's called skin nutrition, that's a combination of grape seed extract, gotcha cola, vitamin C, zinc, and it's also got an extract from melon in it that contains uh, superoxide dismutase, which is a really, really powerful antioxidant that has a big synergistic effect with other nutrients in the body. So I love that. Uh, I have been through patches where I've taken an iron supplement, not at the moment though. Uh, sometimes I will use an extra magnesium supplement. I play with oil sometimes. So I love evening primrose oil. I will usually couple that with a fish oil. Uh, but again, I, I play with that just based on whatever I think on the day. <laughs> what about NAD or NMN or resveratrol, some of the big you know, anti-aging supplements that are so hot right now and everyone's talking about do you take any of those regenerative supplements no no i'm uh, that's not to say not to people if you if you feel benefit from things i never i would never put down anything that's helping someone um but no i I primarily just eat really well in a very nourishing way and then yeah play with those supplements i just mentioned i love vitamin c i always take extra vitamin c there's about a million other questions I have to ask you. So instead of asking them to you now, I'm going to ask if you would consider coming back on the show when you have a tiny little gap in your schedule, because there is so much I want more that I want to ask you. But until then, I just want to say thank you so much for that absolutely brilliant unpacking of um, tests, thyroid health, uh, insulin levels, and such a lot of beautiful wisdom spoken so eloquently and in such a useful way. Um, phenomenal, absolutely wonderful. And I hope it's not another six years before we see each other again. I hope so too, Baha. Thank you. I hope that that was helpful for for people. I hope there's some really practical information in there for people. And yeah, I've got a couple of online courses, a Shake Off Sugar course. There's a detox. I'm going to put a course. link to your website because there are so many of your amazing books that I think people should check out. And of course, courses like we um, created two courses with Rescue Me Academy, and I am a massive believer in self-paced online education for yourself as, as a way of really transforming yourself in an inexpensive and impactful way. So I love that you have those courses uh, available. So I'm going to link back to your website for your books, for your courses, for all of the other incredible assets that you have there as well and also for your supplements thank you that's really kind thank you i've loved our chat. lovely to see you have a wonderful um rest of the week and i'll look forward to seeing you before six years yes let's do that thank you so much Baha.